All right, all right, all right. Okay, Mr. McConaughey, Matthew McConaughey's green lights. Um, I'm trying to see if it can quickly go before the radiator starts churning again. Um, this book basically is a personal memoir kind of advice book of this Hollywood superstar who um, had a tough upbringing and uh, a tough adolescence and an interesting and very adventurous and varied life he has such interesting stories to tell in here they will keep you absolutely glued in my opinion like his life is like what the heck this is crazy you know um so i rating for this i would give this four stars easily i think it was a great read and i absolutely love this book i'm so grateful to have this this was given to me by my eldest sister <laughs> and um um i absolutely loved it there are certain stories that i was like what the heck is going on it felt like i really could hear matthew's voice um come through in uh in uh the book every time that i picked it up it felt like oh like I, as if i didn't put it down like it didn't it wasn't hard to just continue um it was very um it was very consistent and very um yeah, consistent is the word I'm looking for. It was very consistent throughout the whole uh, story, not like having a like different speech and whatnot. The one thing that I did state, um, which I mentioned in my last vlog, was that um, there are certain excerpts here that are a little bit mystical and out there for me and esoteric and ooh, very feely, touchy, emotional feels um, that I was like, I didn't care for too much because they had like a very um, interpretive, abstract essence to them. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the very cool quotes that I felt like, oh my God, this can relate to me so well is... Um, um, is this last line that he said in this sentence it's just something that I was like it's about like adaptability and overcoming and being strong and resilient and whatnot so I was like oh what a wonderful way to say this we're the last to cry uncle to bad luck I feel like I honestly am the last to cry uncle to bad luck never give up never surrender you know sometimes when you have like a series of unfortunate events that happen in your life and you're like you just keep it pushing you stay optimistic you stay hopeful you stay you know happy and resilient and just you know you you stay steadfast and obstinate and just like you just hold your ground and you don't let it kind of like knock you down a little bit <laughs> that sounds like i don't know a song or something but yeah you just kind of like you just don't let it deter you 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 have your tunnel vision you have your goal set in mind and you just stay focused on it you don't let things come to you know distract you and um bring you down so i thought that that was such a wonderful way to write that we are the last to cry uncle to bad luck the full sentence is i'm just going to read the paragraph so it can make more sense instead of just the sentence he says, I come from a family of disciplinarians where you better follow the rules until you're man enough to break them. Where you did what mom and dad said because I said so. And if you didn't, you didn't get grounded. You got the belt or backhand because it gets your attention quicker and doesn't take away your most precious resource, time. I come from a family who took you across town to your favorite cheeseburger and milkshake joint to celebrate your lesson learned immediately following your corporal correction. I come from a family that might penalize you for breaking the rules, but definitely punish you for getting caught. Slightly calloused on the surface, we know that what tickles us often bruises others because we deal with or deny it. We are the last to cry uncle to bad luck. I was like, that's beautiful. I don't know. I don't know. That's beautifully written. Um, okay. Uh, and that was on page uh, tw 25. Now on page 64, OMG, I, I just, this is good. This is what's really going to knock the video to be um, a little lengthy. And I apologize, but you got to hear it. I feel like this is just... <sighs> You guys, there's a story that Matthew tells that I was like, oh my gosh, it feels very cult-like. It feels like 
you're not able to escape. Basically, the essence of it is that he goes off to Australia for a year as an exchange student and he goes out to live with his family who is just less than normal. They are, <laughs> they're weird, they're abnormal and I'm certain he changed the names in the book. But um, yeah, I was like quite uncomfortable. It felt very much so like Midsummer. If you know that movie, you know, oh, that's traumatic movie my friend made me watch it oh my gosh nobody can make me but you know what i mean i watched it because of her <laughs> yeah it's um quite intense that movie and um eerie and spooky and thriller like and suspenseful and just oh you just out of your skin kind of uncomfortable so that's kind of what happened to him in australia so let me see if i could um read this this oh god it's a little lengthy oh my gosh okay so let's start it's on page 64 okay on my 18th birthday my parents said to me if you haven't learned it yet you're not going to in my family the 18th birthday was a seminal moment it meant no more rules it meant no more curfew it meant independence it meant freedom I graduated from high school and like most kids, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I mean, I thought I wanted to go to law school and become a defense attorney, but I wasn't absolutely, absolutely certain. My mom came up with this radical idea. Hey, you love to travel, Matthew. Why? What if you become an exchange student? Immediately I was up for it. Sounds adventurous and wild. I'm in. <laughs> We went to the local Rotary Club that ran the exchange program and learned that they had two openings for a foreign exchange, one to Sweden and one to Australia. Sun, beaches, surfing, L, McPherson, English speaking, I chose Australia. Next thing I knew, I was sitting at a boardroom table in front of 12 suits at the local Rotary Club. After they approved my background papers, a man said, we think you'd be a great ambassador for the state of Texas and the United States in a faraway land, uh, in the faraway land of, of Australia. We'd love for you to go, but before you do, we need you to sign this paper saying you will not come back until your full year of this exchange is over. That seemed odd, but I am going the whole year. That's the plan. Everyone says that, he retorted. But the reason we need you to sign this contract is because every exchange student gets severely homesick and tries to come home early. We can't have that happen, which is why we need you to sign this document stating that I, Matthew McConaughey, promise not to come home early unless there is a tragedy or death in my family. Look, I said, I'm not signing that paper, but I'll shake on it. I'm not going to quit and come home. I'm in for the entire year. I looked him in the eye. Deal? He agreed. We shook and soon I was packing up to go to Australia for a full year. I'd leave in 10 days. So there's like the beginning of this weirdness like here sign this uh, Faustian exchange contract kind of devilish agreement. Like what? <sighs> a few days later I got my first letter from my Australian host family, the Dooleys. It read, we can't wait to meet you and are so looking forward to having you in our home, Matthew. We live in paradise, near the beach, on the outskirts of Sydney. You're going to love it. Yes, outstanding. Everything I was hoping for, the beach, Sydney, this was going to be a blast. Australia, here I come. Day one. I arrived at the Sydney International Airport terminal, duffel bag over my shoulder. I was walking down a long ramp toward a huge room with thousands of people waiting, awaiting their arrivals when I heard through the sea of people chatting and greeting their guests. Matthew! 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 My eyes went to the sound. I saw a hand popping up and down all over the heads and moving toward the end of the ramp. Matthew! 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 As I reached floor level, the owner of that bouncing hand who was yelling my name was there to greet me. With an eager smile, he lowered that hand and I shook it. Meet Norval Dewey. Maybe it's Norval, but I'm going to say Norval. N-O-R-V-E-L. Dewey. D-O-O-L-E-Y. That sounds like such a made up name though. <sighs> okay. Five foot four, 220 pounds mustache, balding head, and a bit of an English accent I would later come to find out was an affection, affectation he used to appear more proper. Ah, oh, there he is. Look at him. Strong, handsome American boy. I'm gonna try that accent. Welcome to Australia, son. 
You're going to love it. He introduced me to his wife, Marjorie. Wearing a white polyester dress with big green polka dots, she was four foot ten and used a walker. Uh, the radiator sorry, is starting, guys. I'm so sorry. Um, using a walker because of a kyphotic spinal deformity, which back then we called a hunchback. hunchback. Um, I leaned down and gave her a big hug and kiss, and she reached up and held my face in her hands, then warmly said, Welcome to Australia, Matthew. Welcome to your new family. Meet my son, Michael. His shirt buttoned down and tucked in with a pocket protector. <laughs> pocket protector. I have a pocket protector. Michael wore a key ring around his right belt hoop loop that held 50 keys 48 of which i would later find out were unnecessary but like his father's accent healthy for his ego oh my gosh so yeah that clip just reminds me of what the son would have acted like just a little strange and weird okay um Alrighty. As I reached out to shake his hand, he sidestepped it in favor of a hearty embrace before he stepped back and began giving me extremely firm, stiff arm slaps to the back of my, to the middle of my back, singing, my little brother, my little brother. Meet the duallys. We loaded into the car and left the airport. I was riding shotgun. Norval was driving. Marjorie and Michael were in the back seat. Okay, so wife, mother, and son were in the back. Father is in the front. I don't know which side. I'm sure Australia is the same as England and a bunch of other places like New Zealand, maybe. Um, and then Matthew's in the passenger side of not his best friend's ride. <laughs> okay, we loaded into the car and I left the airport. I was riding shotgun. Norval was driving. Marjorie and Michael were in the back seat. After about an hour... I noticed the skyline of the metropolitan city of Sydney was well behind us in the rearview mirror. Even the outskirts seem out of sight. I asked Norval, so technically it's not Sydney that you live in, right? No, mate, he proudly replied. That's the big city. Sin, sin, sin. Going on over there, mate. You don't want to be living there. It's no place for civilized men. We actually live in a little place down the road here called Gosford on the central coast. Great spot, beautiful beaches. You're gonna love it. We continued our small talk and drove another 40 minutes when we made it to Gosford. Its population looked to be a couple hundred thousand. It was on the coast with miles of beach, a pretty happening place. This is going to work. Beautiful, I said aloud. They said nothing. We continued driving through downtown another 15 to 20 minutes when i noticed gosford was now in the rearview mirror odd i once again respectfully asked so it's not actually gosford that you live in is it to which norval once again protested with pride oh no still a bit too citified mate loose morals country living's a lot better than that place we actually live just down the road here a bit in a place called tukli you're gonna love it. We drove another 40 minutes, then got to the town of Tukli, population 5,000. It had one red light, one bar, and one small supermarket, but it was still on the coast and a very pretty place. Okay, I said aloud, small town living. Reminds me of where I was born. I can dig it. They had no comment. Norval continued driving. We drove six or seven more minutes and came to the roundabout on the other side of town. Now, quite confused, I asked, so it's not really Tukli that you live in either. Without hesitation and with just as much determination, Norval replied, nah, Tukli's a nice spot, mate, but a big, a bit big for our taste. We actually live in a little gaff down the road here a bit, Matthew, a beautiful little spot called Gorakan. You're going to love it. The pavement turned to blacktop. A few minutes later, we then came upon Gorakan. Population 1,800. A sleepy inland one street country town. No beach in sight. A couple of small one story wooden houses to the left and right of Main Street. Um, I took a semi deep breath and before I knew it, we were going through another roundabout on the other side of town. The blacktop turned to dirt road and Gorakon was in the rearview mirror. 
now a bit peeved, I stated more than I asked. So you don't live in Gorkon either, do you? No, Norval grunted with excitement. But we're very close, mate. Just down the trail here, Spell. Beautiful little country spot, mate. You're gonna love it. We drove down that dusty trail for about five miles. I was staring out the window. That just reminds me of the first episode of Criminal Minds where the girl was trying to check out her, like this Craigslist kind of thing where somebody put um, a car up for sale and it was a trap. It was really awful. Extreme aggressor. We drove down that dusty trail for about five miles. I was staring out the window at the countryside, trying to recalibrate my expectations when a green roadside sign intercepted my view. It read, Warner Vale, Pop 305, 305. With no civilization in view, we drove another mile past that sign and took the first left turn we could, then the first right, then pulled into a gravel driveway up to the garage door of the only house in sight, came to a stop and turned off the ignition. When Norval said with great fanfare, welcome to Australia, Matthew, you're gonna love it. Isn't that crazy? Okay, so let's continue. Um, I'm gonna have to chop it up or else, you know, it's gonna be way too long. Um, so day four, I was washing after dinner dishes when Norval and Marjorie entered the kitchen. Matthew, we'd like to have our extended family over this weekend and we thought you could cook us something. Maybe something quintessentially American. I'd love to, I said. Well, what to cook, I wondered. Ah, nothing more American than a hamburger. That's it, we're having a good old American hamburgers this weekend. Top choice, Matthew, Norval said as they turned to leave. Actually, no, I raised my voice. I take that back. We're having cheeseburger, because the man who invented the hamburger was smart, but the man who invented the cheeseburger was a genius. <laughs> I started writing down a grocery list for my culinary masterpiece. Soft white buns, dill pickle slices, cheddar and American cheese, red onion, avocado, jalapenos, real mayonnaise, good ketchup. When I felt a tap on my shoulder, it was normal. Matthew, would you come with me, please? I'd like to have a talk with you for a second. We exited the kitchen, walked across the living room and down a hallway where he opened the second door on the right. This way, please, he said as he ushered me into the room. It was his office. He then shut the door behind us and pointed to the seat in front of the desk. I sat down. He then went behind the desk and stepped up onto a platform where his chair was perched, then sat in it. Oddly, Norval, who was five foot four, was now sitting about a foot and a half higher than I was. He settled in and leaned forward. Placing his elbows on the desk, he crossed his hands knuckle for knuckle, looked me in the eye and sternly said, Matthew, I'd like to talk to you about your choice of words. Yes, sir, I said, what do you got? Chin on those knuckles, he turned his eyes to a portrait of Winston Churchill on the wall, took a composing inhale and said, you said that the man who invented the hamburger was smart, but the man who invented the cheeseburger was a genius, did you not? Yes, sir, I did say that. He took another <laughs> aristocratic breath. Matthew, that is merely your opinion. And in your time here with us, you will learn to appreciate fine wines, fine cheeses, and not to voice your opinion for the masses. Norval, it's a figure of speech, I said. It just basically means I like cheeseburgers more than hamburgers. Ah, ah, ah. He chided as he waved his finger at me. As I said, for the duration of your stay in Australia, with us here in the Dooley household, you will learn to appreciate fine wines, fine cheeses, and not to voice your opinion for the masses. He was dead serious. Other than the Dooley's thinking that more than a couple of hours away was still the outskirts of Sydney, this nonsensical lecture was the first odd thing that happened to me in Australia. I was puzzled, but I chalked it up to cultural differences. Day eight, I started school. 
I had already graduated in America, but the school decided to enroll me with a junior class since I had arrived midterm. The thinking was I could go into my senior term next year with the same group of kids. Two weeks into the curriculum, the year and a half old syllabus seemed like a breeze to me. Math was so easy, it was boring, but I enjoyed my creative writing in the English classes. The teachers, on the other hand, were not. They read pen, marked up everything I wrote and gave me F minuses across the board because of my use of contractions, euphemisms, made up words, and occasional profanity. Look, I know how to write. I passed those tests. I am, de I am deliberately writing how I am. I'm being creative, expressing myself, I said. Their response, F minus. Socially, the school was awkward as well. Everyone wore uniforms and played tag at lunch. No one had a driver's license. No one wanted to party and the chicks were not digging me. I felt like I was back in junior high. I started missing my truck, my friends, those girlfriends, my freedom, Texas. But I told myself everything was fine, all part of the adventure, cultural differences. I soon started skipping class daily and going to the library instead where he uh, discovered the great English poet Lord Byron and he had some cassettes in excess. Uh, Maxi Priest and U2 um, and he listened to them on the Walkman uh, while he read about romance. Uh, two weeks later the principal came to the library. Matthew, he said, it doesn't seem like the school thing is working out for you mate. I was thinking that maybe you could transfer into our work experience program where you would practice a trade off campus. You wouldn't get paid but you would get school credit. Matthew goes, F guess, I'm in. So his first job was um, as a bank teller at the Australian and New Zealand Bank. He became friends with some people there. Um, we also meet this new character named Meredith who is kind of a friend to the Dooleys. So it's Norval, the husband, Marjorie, the wife, Michael, the son, and um, Michael's girlfriend, Meredith. Um, yeah. So Matthew goes, um, while at the dinner table one late afternoon, I had the Summer Olympics on the television just in view from the living room. The U.S. was about to race in the finals of the women's 4x100 meter relay. Um, I seemed to be the only one interesting. interested. <laughs> Bang! The starting gun went off and less than 42 seconds later, the U.S. women had won gold. I clenched my fist in pride and patriotism and let out a muttered, yes. yes, mostly to myself. Norval evidently saw this as an ideal moment for a history lesson. He leapt from his chair and scampered into the living room where he shut off the TV mid post race celebration and then marched back to the kitchen standing over me, he said, Matthew, would you uh, come with me, please? I'd like to talk to you for a second. Uh-oh. He escorted me out of the kitchen, across the living room, and down the hallway to the second door on the right. Yes, back to his office where his time, where this time he grabbed an encyclopedia off his bookshelf, sat upon his high chair, glanced at Winston Churchill on the wall, opened the encyclopedia to a dog-eared page and began to lecture me. A real athlete, Matthew, a great athlete, was this young chap from Great Britain named David Broom, who in the 1960 Summer Olympics won a bronze medal in the equestrian, equestrian event of show jumping. Okay, that's cool, Norval, I said. And another thing, Matthew, that silly movie Stripes you were watching the other night, it's brainless and immature. It's a further example of inferi inferiority of American humor to that of the English. Wow. Okay, mind if I go finish watching the Olympics? I was starting to feel pretty uncomfortable at the duelies, but hey, I told myself again, it's just cultural differences. Day 90. Now getting my work experience as a barista's assistant, I was enjoying my days in court, helping write closing arguments, studying the jury, researching law history, and taking notes for the jurist I was assisting. It was also a great preparation for my future plans to become a lawyer. Still back at the Dooleys, the cultural differences were starting to get to me. 
my identity shaken. I needed some resistance to find my footing, something to overcome, a discipline to adhere to, a sense of purpose so I could better maintain my sanity in the strange place I was in. I decided to become a vegetarian. The problem was I didn't know how to be a vegetarian, so I began eating a head of iceberg lettuce with ketchup on it for dinner every night. I also began running six miles a day after work. I got very thin. Um, I also decided to become abstinent for the rest of the year, which still had nine months in it. <laughs> I started to believe that my life's calling was to become a monk. I made plans to go to South Africa after my year's exchange and free Nelson Mandela. I wrote letters to my mom and dad, friends, and old girlfriends. My very first letter, which I wrote my first week at the Dooley's, was scrawled in a black um, Sharpie. Hey, throwing some shrimp on the Barbie. Love you, Matthew. But now my letters were becoming 9, 10, 11, 12, 16 pages long with minute and meticulous handwriting and eight line run on sentences full of too many adjectives and adverbs. Other than my mom, my childhood friend Rob Bindler was the only one who would write me back. A writer himself, he accepted my, ma my manic filibusters on the page and returned them with equal length but less derangement. Mostly though, I wrote to myself. But I was fine, right? Just a little homesickness. Cultural differences. I got this. Day 122. 5.15 p.m. I was quietly eating my lettuce head and ketchup at the dinner table with Norval, Marjorie, Michael, and Meredith, Michael's girlfriend, when the mint jelly came around with a lamb and I immediately passed it on. Seeing this, Norval abruptly stood up and addressed me. Matthew, you are young and immature American, and you will appreciate that during your stay in Australia with us in this household, you will learn that mint jelly goes with lamb. I've had mint jelly, I said. I don't really like it, and besides, I'm not eating meat anyway. A couple of weeks later, at the end of another extended family Saturday barbecue, no burgers this time, Marjorie, the wife, the mom, called to me in the kitchen where I was washing up the dishes. Matthew, come here, she shouted. Matthew, come here. As I entered the living room, I saw the whole family, aunts, uncles, and cousins, all 18 of them, standing in line, in a line against the wall. At the very end of the line was Meredith, bashfully looking down, a couple of fingers tickling her brow. Everyone was awaiting my arrival. What's up, I asked. Michael was on the opposite side of the room, standing in a corner, nervously twiddling those 50 keys. Then Marjorie, who'd been sipping her wine all day, giddily said to me and everyone in the room, Matthew, Meredith's about to leave. Why don't you give her a kiss goodbye on the lippies? Everyone oohed and awed and giggled with mischief. Meredith kept her head down, five fingers now at her cheek. Michael held his clenched fist at his side and began to pace. I already said goodbye to Meredith, Marjorie. I gave her a hug too, I said. Not to be denied, Marjorie swooned. No, no, Matthew, go on now. Give her a kiss on the lippies. No, God, please, no. What? I said, then glanced to the end of the line at Meredith, who raised her chin just high enough to catch my eye, then quickly lowered it again. I tried to understand what was happening. Had Meredith over the past few months mistaken my warm hearted humor and goodwill as romantic advances and in doing so formed a crush on me or had Marjorie just had a few too many and decided to try to pull off a tasteless prank to humiliate me Meredith and especially Michael I didn't know but either or both ways handling it this way was wrong my big brother Michael was now pacing uh, with more disgraced spite twirling those 50 keys even faster Everyone else started goading me. Yeah, do it, Matthew, do it. How am I going to alleviate this situation? I thought, then took a deep breath and walked over to Meredith and calmly said to her, Meredith, did I already give you a hug goodbye? Meredith, too embarrassed to look up, said nothing. And then put, I then put two fatherly hands on her shoulders and waited until she finally raised her eyes to me. The room had started to sober up. I already gave you a hug goodbye, didn't I, Meredith? She slowly started nodding yes. Thank you, I said. Thank you, she said under her breath. 
Then I turned to Marjorie and sternly spoke my mind. Marjorie, don't you ever do that to me again. It is not fair. It's not fair to me. It's not fair to Meredith and it's not fair to your son, Michael. Then I walked out of the room and back to the kitchen to finish the dishes. Damn cultural differences. My man. Day 148. I was down to 140 pounds and my nose was constantly running. For the past month, every night after dinner, I'd go back to my restroom, run a hot bath, listen to one of my three cassettes on my Walkman and write another 15 page letter to myself. I was sitting at the dinner table again, head down, eating my head of lettuce with ketchup, biding my time until 5.45 when I could head back to the bathroom for my evening ritual. When out of nowhere, Norval said, Matthew, Marjorie and I have decided that for the duration of your stay here in Australia with us, you'll refer to us as mom and pop. Now this one caught me off guard. I was speechless for a few moments as I considered how to respond. Thank you, Norval, I said. Thank you for thinking of me that way. But I have a mom and dad and they're still alive. Norval quickly snapped back. As I said, Marjorie and I have decided that for the duration of your stay in Australia with us in this household, you will refer to us as mom and pop. I said nothing and instead returned to finish the last of my ketchup covered lettuce. When I was done, I politely cleared everyone's plate, took them to the kitchen and washed them, then stopped at the dinner table to clearly address everyone before I headed back to the privacy of my evening protocol. Good night, Norval. Good night, Marjorie. Good night, Michael. Good night, Meredith. But it's like, good night, Norval. Good night, Marjorie. For the first time in 148 days, my head, heart, and spirit immediately agreed on something. No, there's no way I'm calling anybody other than my own mom and dad, mom and pop. That is not negotiable. This is not a cultural difference. And if it is, then I'm not sorry. I'm just different. Alone in this foreign country, on my own, in this uncomfortable world, I took responsibility for who I was and what I believed in. I made a judgment and I chose. I did not need a reassurance and the clarity gave me identity. Um, I was not going to lose my anchor both on principle and in order to survive. The next morning, my alarm clock was the sound of a shrieking woman from the other end of the house. It was 6 a.m. He won't call me mom. He won't call me mom. I jumped out of bed and ran to find Marjorie, bawling her eyes out, puddle of tears on the table, shrieking to the heavens. I put my arm around her. Come on, Marjorie, it's not personal. How would you feel if your son Michael called someone else mom and pop? We had a good cry together for different reasons. That's when I decided that maybe it was time for me to find another family to live with for the duration of my stay. Um, okay, so there was a tornado that afternoon. He went for a run. And um, he basically asked his uh, co-worker at the bank to see if he could, you know, kind of do like an exchange to a different family. You know, everybody um, agreed that he should. Yeah, so basically, um, this guy, um, his uh, co-worker said that he would be picking him up from the Dooley's house around 6.30 on a Tuesday. Um, and uh, Norval was there too. It was like an, uh, an announcement that was made. And um, yeah, he was there as well. So Norval and I rode home together. He said nothing to me. So basically, just to be clear, um, basically it was announced kind of like to this Rotary Club in Australia that he was going to be living with a different family and Norval was there and, you know, everybody's applauding and like, oh, okay, we're so glad for you, Matthew, and all those things. So now Matthew and Norval are going back home together. So Norval and I rode home together. He said nothing to me. That night, I said goodnight to Norval and Marjorie before bed. They said goodnight back, nothing more. The next morning I woke up, had breakfast, went to work, came home, had dinner, and said goodnight again before bed, nothing. Saturday came, there was no family over for a goodbye party, no what are we gonna do on your last days here, nothing. Sunday, nothing. Monday, nothing. Tuesday morning, nothing. I came home from work early. My two suitcases have been packed since last Thursday night and triple check that I had everything ready to go. Five days had passed with not one word of acknowledgement of my leaving when we sat down at the dinner table to have our final 
5 p.m. supper together. Me, Norval, Marjorie, Michael, and Meredith. I chomped on my lettuce head with ketchup. They ate in silence. At 5.30, I got up from the table and went to wash the dishes. Nothing. When I was done, I walked back to my room to quadruple check that I had everything packed. Connor was going to be here in less than 30 minutes. He couldn't come soon enough. I paced my bedroom floor, checking my watch every 30 seconds. Then I heard a knock on my door. I opened it. And there in the doorway stood Norval Dooley, hands on his hips, legs slightly apart, in a sturdy, squared up stance. Hey, Norval, what's up? Without flinching, he said, Matthew, Marjorie and I have decided that you will be staying with us for the duration of your stay in Australia, in this household with us. Unpack your bags. In the twilight of my twilight zone, shocked, I rallied and took the high road once again. Uh, thank you, Norval, for offering your home to me for the rest of my stay here in Australia, I said, trying to remain calm. But I have a full year in your country, in Warnervale, and I want to experience as much as possible. And living with a different family will be another experience for me. He raised his chin and settled his heels into the floor. Matthew, unpack your bags. Marjorie and I have decided that you'll be staying with us for the duration of your stay here in Australia, he repeated. I lost it. I reared back and sent a vicious left hook through the bedroom door, so forceful that my fist came out the other side. I pulled my arm out, bloody and pierced from shards of plywood. I was shaking, full of rage, confused again. Norval started to shake as well, his eyes bulging in shock. Norval, I growled, you get your fat effing ass out of the way or I'm going to beat you to the ground and drag you across your gravel driveway for so long that you're gonna be pulling rocks out of your back until the day you effing die. He started twitching. His mouth began to tremble and drop open. Then he began to back up. I stood there staring him down, fists clenched with a bloody arm, about to piss my pants. I was so livid. That's when he turned around and ran off down the hallway. I removed the splinters from my arm and washed it in the bathroom sink. I soaked a towel with cold water and wiped my arm and face. I paced the room trying to bring my heart rate down and figure out what the heck had just gone down. When I heard the sound of a car horn, I looked at my watch. It was 630. I rolled my bags down the hallway, past Norville's office, across the living room, through the kitchen, and out the garage uh, to the driveway. There was Connor Harrington in his Land Cruiser. Norville was there, too, along with Marjorie, Michael, and Meredith, everybody hugging and carrying on like they were sending their last son off to join the army overseas. Marjorie wept on her walker. Michael was crying like a baby as he gave me a bear hug. Meredith sobbed and tickled uh, her cheeks as I kissed her on the forehead. Even Norville dried a tear. They loaded my suitcases in the back of the Land Cruiser, and Connor and I drove away. In the rearview mirror, the dualies were lined up at the top of the driveway, standing in the very place where I had stood when I first arrived, arms around each other, shedding tears and waving goodbye until I was out of sight. So I want to thank you guys so much for hanging out with me and um, hopefully you stuck around for that story because I thought it was quite incredible and funny and just like well written. And as the video is coming to a close, the radiator is dying down as well. So, um, yeah, so I'm just so grateful to have been able to read these stories and I can't wait to, you know, get into the, um, the February reads as well. So, um, I really hope you enjoyed the video and I will catch you in my very next one. Bye. This is our past. This is where we have been. This is how we got here. This is who we are today.